Welcome to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. This week, Kim Jong-un won 100% of the parliamentary vote in his constituency. State media reports that this is an expression of the people's absolute support and profound trust in Supreme Leader Kim Jong-un. As they single-mindedly remain loyal to him, holding him in high esteem. In the glorious U.S. financial markets, media loyal to markets holding them in high esteem report that 100% of market participants are winning because the people remain single-mindedly loyal to the Dow Jones. Abundant wealth has fallen upon the people. A new record high of 80 bazillion dollars. Ha <laughs> <laughs> Stacy. Actually, I think it's 80 trillion dollars they're now worth. <laughs> but it might as well be 80 bazillion. So let's look at what this glorious wealth creation in the United States has happened. What caused the glorious jump in household wealth in one insanely good chart? And who will blow it up again? So the value of household real estate jumped 11.7% to $22 trillion, and stocks held by households skyrocketed 34.6% to $13.9 trillion. And the net worth of households and nonprofits lumped ingenuously together, ballooned by $9.8 trillion, or 14%, to an all-time record of $80.7 trillion, driven largely by soaring stocks and home values, and an economy that barely budged. So all the values of the things that the Fed could drive went up the economy itself not so much well I mean uh, increased to even greater significance and degree is the amount of debt in the system so the margin debt which is the debt used to buy stocks in the New York Stock Exchange hit a new all-time high and uh, shattering records from 1987 and 2007 mortgage debt shattering records bank debt shattering records global debt derivatives debt shattering all kinds of records so we have a spider's web of debt that's being created around a collateral that is less than maybe one little spider egg. But nevertheless, you know, spiders actually eat their uh, webs and then recycle them. I just learned that on Uberfax. Well, you, there's also a record amount of margin debt that's hit an all-time high as well, much higher than pre-collapse. No, no, absolutely. Margin debt is skyrocketing on the New York Stock Exchange. And, of course, all of this debt is, uh, is, is similar to what happened in 2007. Once it, once it hits its peak debt, saturation, then there's a huge collapse. And then everyone in charge will say, we never saw it coming, except for Peter Schiff. So let's look at this chart here. This is the one chart that shows you that the glorious wealth jump is about to collapse. And the blue line is household net worth. And the red line is SOMA, which is system open market account. And uh, you see the Fed goes insane in 2008. And then the Fed goes completely insane in the last few years. And Isn't SOMA <laughs> what they talked about in Aldous Huxley's Brave New World as yeah. the opiate of the masses? Yes. Was this a, meant to be ironic? Or is this truly, <laughs> am I having crazy visions of uh, the fictional world overlapping the fictional world of finance? Well, as you saw from that chart, it was like the Fed balance sheet was rising faster and faster, and they were throwing more and more at it. And all they've been able to manage to do is get house prices to rise by a piddly $2.3 trillion, markets to rise by a piddly, you know, 34.6%. So they're taking a lot of uh, SOMA. <laughs> yeah, no, it's like SOMA. those uh, Syrian hospitals where they ask you to be beamed in the head with a steel pipe to put you unconscious before surgery. That's the SOMA of the financial liquidate being pumped into the corpse that is the economy. Well, George Carlin did say you have to be asleep to believe in the American dream. So it makes sense that SOMA would be tied to the American dream. And the American dream is that everybody could always get wealthier. Everybody, your house, everybody owns a home and you'll always be able yeah. to retire on it. Yeah, George Carlin stole it from me. <laughs> like David Letterman stole a lot of my stuff too back in the 80s. Well, so the one uh, person who they could blow it up again, this article is positing that it could be the Dallas Fed president Richard Fisher, he saw increasing signs that QE has overstayed its welcome and that market distortions and acting on bad incentives are becoming more pervasive. Fed speak for pandemic. Stock market metrics were at eye popping levels, he said, with valuations that relied on belief in a financial ferry. So he also mentioned the increase in margin debt. And so here's this Dallas Fed president. And he thinks that we need to really pull back 
QE even further and faster than we already are. Unfortunately, they can't pull back QE at all because it is the wormhole through which all of the global economy has skirted through to the other side, living in a world of upside down financial reality where printing money uh, is somehow commensurate with growth while allowing wages to collapse, allowing uh, jobs to disappear. So the only thing left is, uh, I'm afraid, <laughs> social unrest. Well, if we're comparing this to North Korea, then of course this, this, uh, the president of the Dallas Fed, Richard Fisher, is like that human scum, Uncle Jang, <laughs> who was executed. You know, it's the, the, the Fed, and remember during the crash, the previous crash, what happened is that uh, it was the people who were short selling, who were saying this market is crap. Those were the people who were vilified as saying, you know, that they were somehow disobedient or disloyal to the market, to the glorious market. Let's be clear about something. Quantitative easing is financial earwax, basically. <laughs> it, it's the product of uh, detritus that's accumulating in an instrument meant to do something of use, that is the ear, but it gets clogged up with earwax and that has to be removed at some point. Here in the financial global markets, you have the instrument of capitalism which is being gummed up with the earwax of quantitative easing. When it gets removed and people finally hear what the true price signal is telling them, that these things are overvalued enormously, then of course the number of suicide bankers will go from 12 currently around the world to 1,200. And you got to ask yourself, well, you can fill in the blanks. So Bloomberg did a poll and to see if Americans felt wealthier because wealth was up 14% last year. Surely everybody feels really good, right? Well, poll, stock market's gains, no help for most Americans. 77% of respondents dismissed the 176% rise in the Standard & Poor's 500 index since its March 9th, 2009 financial crisis low, according to the poll, taken March 7th through the 10th. Barely one in five or 20% so the market's gains have made them feel more financially secure. And they talked to one very disloyal person and he said, I don't think there's anything real behind it, said David Skelly, 47, a policeman in Kanakaki, Illinois. It's just an artificial boom. Sure enough, uh, most people are on the sidelines, they're not participating, and uh, when they do get involved, they are reamed unmercifully with fees mm. and charlatans who feed them nonsense uh, investments to begin with until the next collapse. And then the number of people who are participating gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And so you have this little island of folks that are manipulating things and they surround themselves, they barricade themselves in, they live in these bunkers and they hope that nobody finds them once the revolution <laughs> begins and they're looking for them. The other thing, of course, is, as you mentioned, kind of you're alluding to there, is that the fraud has not left the system. That's still with us. And that's why going back to that chart, the Fed has to go more and more insane because they don't want to punish that fraud because, the, you know, all the member banks are the ones committing the fraud. Well, here's another story that we've been following over the, since the financial collapse, and that's high-frequency trading. High-frequency trading hails its first billionaire. Vincent Vinnie Viola, the founder of Virtue Financial Incorporated, is high-frequency trading's first billionaire. He has an impressive track record of just one losing trading day during a 1,238 trading day period. How does he do it? The same way other high frequency traders do it. Front running trades and scalping countless billions and billions of fractions of pennies in the process. Yeah, Vinny the Goomba, <laughs> high frequency trader, you know, he's out there basically constructing a toll booth between him and the markets and he it takes money, he steals money. I mean, the kid, Vinny the Goomba, when he was a kid in elementary school, would be shaking kids down for their milk money. Now he's got computers that are shaking the market down mm -hmm. for free extortionary rates. It's pure mafioso, uh, high tech style. So, I mean, I, I suppose it's great that he's not whacking guys over the head in New Jersey like Tony <laughs> Soprano, but it's the same frickin' mafia mentality, the Goomba. He's got there, Vinny the billionaire Goomba. The other thing is, since we're comparing everything to North Korea, we in the West laugh and mock Kim Jong-un for winning 100% of the vote and then issuing a statement that this shows the you know, absolute loyalty of the people and love by the people for the, this supreme leader. Well, where is the mockery 
when this guy has 1,328 perfect trading days, when Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan had perfect trading quarter after trading quarter after trading quarter. Where is the mockery there? Markets aren't supposed to be so predictable that every, these guys can have 100% pure perfect trading days. No, I think the comparison to Kim Jong-un is a good one in that if you look at the news from there, you see that people are involved in a psychopathic cult worship of a psychopath, and they're in the street crying, oh, we love you, we love you. Here in America, you've got Vinny the Goomba. He's stealing billions, and people are in the street, we love you, we love you, we love you, Kim Jong-un. I mean, Vinny the Goomba. And it's the same kind of cult. In North Korea, they worship hatred of America. In Wall Street, they worship hatred of democracy, hatred of the common person, hatred of egalitarianism, hatred of fair markets, hatred of free markets. So Vinny, he's a hate monger, and he's made a billion dollars promoting hate. And as the Kim Jong-un is a, a good example, uh, you know, when the... You know, when the fly hits the fan, not good things happen. But this is the reason why he's going to become a billionaire is technically on paper because he's going to IPO. Usually, IPOs signal a bad time to actually buy. <laughs> well, he's cashing out into the public domain. So, all the people that he does counterparties with on this high frequency trading scam are now going to participate in the IPO by making sure that the price is supported through its initial IPO period, and they'll dump a lot of the stock into pension funds. Firemen, teachers will end up owning Vinnie the Goomba's high-frequency trading IPO. Six months from t when it goes IPO, as night follows day, the price will be down 50, 60, 70 percent. The people in the pension accounts will be left once again holding worthless pieces of paper and wondering, why does my pension account underperform the market? Is it because the manager is in bed with a charlatan and a gangster? Yeah, that's right. You're being ripped off. Just like Kim Jong-un is ripping off his people. You're being ripped off by your pension fund manager. Wake up! And finally on this, the reason why he might be IPOing is there are serious investigations starting to happen in the Senate that they're looking at this high-frequency trading and realizing a, a, 10 years too late that it's just scalping the markets and not actually not adding any wealth. It's just taking out wealth. It's extortion. And yeah, of course, they're going to try to IPO and dump it in pension accounts as quickly as possible where it'll fester and turn into a oozing pus of capital losses. <laughs> and, and Vinny will be down there in Monaco with, uh, you know, Sir Philip Green smoking a cigar. Hey, buddy, how's it come on my yacht? Yeah, everything's good. Here's Kate Moss. Uh, show her the new line of bikinis, Kate. Yeah, look at that. Look at that. Little oh, Kate looking so cute. Yeah. All right. Well, we got to go. So stay tuned. We got to go. <laughs> okay, dear leader. <laughs> Stay tuned for the second half, a whole lot more. If we you know, recall the very black and white approach that the European Union took uh, to this issue in the beginning of the crisis, you know, either you're with us or you're with Russia, uh, was that a pragmatic path? you know, a reasonable path to follow. I think it was a foolish approach from, from on behalf of the European Union. I, I, I said, I wrote, that the European Union didn't know what, what, what it was stepping into. A worldwide investigation of the fishing industry reveals what's hidden in fish farms' waters. Today you have a pandemic because PD and ISA is spread all over Norway. It's the most toxic food you have in the whole world. Growing profit drowns out an official inquiry. Furthermore, health restrictions. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know about that uh, research uh, program, so I, I can't uh, say anything about that now. Who really knows what's inside the filet of fish. Dramas that can't be ignored. Stories others refuse to notice. Faces changing the world right now. A full picture of today's news, live 
on demand from around the globe. Rockling.tv Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Time now to turn to investment banker Chris Whalen. He's the co-author of a new book out later this year called Financial Stability, Fraud, Confidence, and the Wealth of Nations. Chris Whalen, welcome back to the Kaiser Report. Nice to be here, Max. So what are you doing in London? Well, we were just in Paris. I was at a conference sponsored by the Global Interdependence Center and the Banque de France, looking at all sorts of uh, financial issues. And I came over to London to see you. Oh, fantastic. And also no. visit with some clients. And I, I've lived in London twice, so I, I really enjoy being here. Right, so we're roughly contemporaries. Had I stayed on Wall Street, we would be doing deals together at right. this time. But <laughs> you, you're still on Wall Street. You're doing deals. You've got this book. It's called Financial Stability, Fraud, Confidence, and Wealth of Nations. So first of all, as a banker, that word fraud is a pretty heavy word to slip into the title of a book. Right. T just tell me about that to, to begin with. Well, if you go back to the beginning of history, you know, why did Jesus throw the money changers out of the temple? Because they were using two measures. And fraud is really that. It's when you try and uh, sell something that's not what it seems. It's, it's dishonesty in its most basic form. Uh, if you go back to the Greeks, uh, proportional requital, fair dealing, each side must get value in a transaction. Fraud is when that doesn't happen. Okay, fraud is uh, breaking the law for a lot, a lot, a lot De of time. Right, deception. Deception, which in the le in context of securities means you know certain law breaking uh, as it applies right. to the Securities Acts of '33 and '34 and the uh, right. Sarbanes-Oxley and everything that's come along. But in Wall Street, fraud seems to be you get penalized with a f with a fine. There's no criminal investigation. And Whoa, it seems like the, right. the, the fines on the civil side are always much less than the profit made from the criminal activity to begin with. Correct. So isn't fraud the business model of these banks? It is today because we don't enforce the law. I mean, if you really think, why did we have a crisis in 2008? It was because of securities fraud. And the regulators, Congress, all of the G10 nations, their solution to the crisis was more capital really anything but looking at the issue of fraud. Going back to 2008, the big question is, there was a chance to crack down on fraud right. and reform and restart the clock, and like they did in the going back to the 30s, That's after right. the crash of the 30s. That did not happen, the excuse being that, well, the whole system would have gone under. Hmm. Where do you fit in? Where do you come in on that debate? No, I think that's wrong. I, I think the only way you restore confidence, going back to the title of our book, is if you enforce the rules against fraud. The first part of the response to the crisis was the right one: throw money at it. The central banks printed money, stabilized things. But if you don't go on to the second piece, which is restructuring and also to some extent punishing the guilty, then you never give confidence back to investors. That's what really happened in But when you throw money at a situation, you enter that slippery slope of moral hazard. Well, of course. But and, the, and there's no coming back from that. There's no, there's no sheriff. No, no, that's not right. People misunderstand. The reason you throw money at the problem is because one morning in 2008, the global investment community woke up and they realized that the balance sheet was out of balance. But due to fraud? Due to fraud. OK, so why and not it, punish fraud? Well, you do. But you have to do it sequentially because if you simply allow a deflation, you wipe out all the equity in the economy. You have nothing to build on. Okay. That's what I we want, did in the 30s. I want to jump. I want to put put a stop there. I want to move on to today because today we've right. got two major situations brewing hmm. that I want your take on. One is Detroit. One is Puerto Rico. Let's start with Detroit. What's going on? Well, in Detroit, you have a bankruptcy, obviously, of a very large city that doesn't need to exist anymore. The, the reason Detroit is where it is is because years ago, immigrants came down the St. Lawrence Seaway, including Henry Ford. And when they uh, came onto the land, they had to build wagons to move their goods. That's why you have the auto industry in Michigan, very simply stated. So it doesn't need to be there anymore. The city has dragged its feet restructuring. And unfortunately, the banks, too, showed up and took advantage of what was essentially an insolvent city put together what's clearly, I think, a fraudulent transaction where they pretended to do all sorts of off-balance sheet deals to help them buy more time, to make pension payments and thereby avoid default. So now you have the bankruptcy judge in the case essentially ordering the city to sue the banks and saying that we're not going to settle with them, that these contracts were clearly fraudulent and that they ought to be uh, opposed and, At the and moment, Detroit is facing bankruptcy? No, they're already in bankruptcy. They're in bankruptcy. So the right. timeline is 
they're in bankruptcy. Right. And the next major milestone here is? Well, it's going to be a whole series of repudiations of pension obligations, debt held by banks, by other financial institutions. There's a list of creditors, Max, that goes on for 100 pages. Okay, so you and made your bones on Wall Street for 30 years doing due right. diligence. Right. This is your bailiwick. This, you look at all these documents and you yeah. figure out all the collateral and all the contingent yeah. liabilities. So what is, you're one of the experts here. What is your prognosis for Detroit? What's going to happen? Well, what's going to happen is they're going to push losses on the most of their creditors. They're going to restructure. They're going to get rid of about half the city because it was built for two billion people. They have three quarters of a million residents now. They're going to bulldoze a lot of houses and they're going to try and rationalize the place so that it works. But the politics here are very, very dangerous for Wall Street because you have a governor, you have a mayor, all of whom have to provide services to this city. And they may not be able to do that unless everybody settles pretty quickly this year. But Wall Street tries to w wiggle their way out of these obligations in well, one way or another. But well, you're saying, I believe, we're looking at some of your latest work, that the judge in this case yes, is he, coming down hard on Wall hard. Street. So right. speak specifically about specifically what's going on there. Well, what's going on is that the city had an obligation to pay uh, uh, credit default swaps, hundreds of millions of dollars. And the judge saw a settlement for $165 million from the city manager, proposed to pay the banks to get out of these obligations, and the judge said no. This is one of the most veteran bankruptcy judges in the United States, by the way. He's no fool. Is this similar to Jefferson County, uh, where they were it, caught it, up in credit default swaps, that's and right. uh, J.P. Morgan was in there, that's they right. missold them, and they, they went bankrupt, and right. they ended up missing a huge sewer payment, and well, they got flooded right. in crap. We've Literally. seen this movie before, where you have large banks preying upon a public sector entity that's probably not sophisticated enough to really understand the risk in these transactions. But how can we see it's a serial financial crime? Yes, that's right. JP Morgan, who's the bank in charge of this one? Uh, well, there's two actually, UBS and uh, Merrill Lynch. So w there's a serial pattern of serial offenses here. Yes. And, and again, it's completely fraudulent. Well, it and again, appears nobody, that way, yeah. Who, who's in charge? Is it, is it Eric Holder? Is it Department of Justice? Is it the SEC? Who, who can step in and say, you know what, All enough of the is above. enough? Because think of it, why should we allow a bank to, to prey upon a public sector entity with uh, officials who really aren't sophisticated investors. They don't have the competency to judge these transactions. It's not a suitable transaction for the entity. And moreover, it was designed to help the city evade a legal debt limit put in place by the state legislature. We saw that in, in Greece. Right. Well, they got into the euro. Very similar to Greece. Totally fraudulent. Goldman Sachs. Uh, John Paulson, hedge fund manager, right. leadership of uh, Greece, in, in, involved in a credit default fraud, credit yeah, default swap fraud. If you read the complaint filed by the city of Detroit at the behest of the judge, by the way, the judge essentially forced the city to sue the banks and the pension funds. Uh, it's pretty clear what went on here. And the sad part, Max, is that these transactions delayed the bankruptcy filing by a couple of years. The city could have been much further along in getting its house in order, and the pension. Uh, recipients, they're the real victims here because they thought that they had X amount of money, but no, now the city is going to claw back those phony uh, payments that were made because of all of the uh, financial engineering by the banks, and they're going to have much less money for their pensions going forward. Well, in the first half of the show, I mentioned that pension funds are typically where bad debts and bad investments go to die. You right. hire an incompetent person to manage the pension fund, That's right. then you get them to buy into, like, there's this high frequency trading company that's going to go public. It's mm -hmm. going to do an IPO. That's you know, right. a lot of that stock's going to end up in a pension fund. And in six months to a year from now, it'll be down 50 or 60 percent when that mm -hmm. high frequency trading bubble bursts. And those people wonder, how do we end up with all these losses? Well, because yeah, but the other guilty parties here are the union leadership who cut a deal with the city for benefits that they knew the city couldn't afford. That's the, that's the other thing that nobody really focuses on. Well, that is, we, that is not focused on, because we talk about the rating agencies, the banks, the politicians, uh, the funds. That's right. Uh, are all complicit in massive fraud. We don't talk about union leaders as being part and parcel of that fraud. Because well, they claim to have cut a good deal for their members, but they knew, or they should have known, that the city could never afford the deal. That seemed, of all the guilty parties, they right. seem like the least list. culpable. But <laughs> they're just, okay. So now let's talk about interest rate swaps for a second, credit default swaps for a second, because they're sold on the idea that you're hedging against interest rate rises. Right. That there's going to be a rise in interest rates. You need to buy this insurance. You need right, to buy right. this product against an interest rate rise. That's right. So what happens is uh, the interest rates, in fact, go down. Right. And so these products become, they have to meet the margin call. They have to cough up more money. That's right. They, and, and it's, so how, does, how do you weigh that against the fact that at the same time, 
the central banks are engineering artificially low interest rates. Well, that's right. If you were reading the paper and you were running the city of Detroit, would you have been worried about interest rates rising? No. No. Especially but if you're a banker frame. at J.P. Morgan or Credit right. Suisse or that's Merrill right. Lynch and you know that the Fed is engineering lower interest rates, that's right. how can you in, in any sane person sell a hedge against higher rates? Well, that's exactly right. And there are school districts and cities and towns, all of whom have been victimized in this way. So it was Ben Bernanke down, down at Yellen. Here we got Mark Carney, Bank of England. Right. Is it, is it, am I speaking uh, you know, re, uh, you know, hyperbolically if I say that they are also involved in this fraud? No, they're doing what they're supposed to do, which is print money to make up for the stupid things that the private sector did earlier. But shouldn't they be communicating to these people that they're buying into fraudulent products? The Fed does have a responsibility here, because if you put on their other hat as the supervisor of big banks, the question is, do you want your big banks to take the reputational risk of getting involved in transactions that are clearly fraudulent, and where they could be subject to attack by, for example, the governor of Michigan, who's running for re-election this year. You know, this is an issue that is ripe for politics. And we shouldn't allow big banks to put themselves in a position where they're going to be crucified publicly. Imagine if the lights go off in Detroit and they're not collecting the garbage anymore because they don't come up with a settlement. Imagine if this whole bankruptcy goes into years of litigation. You can almost assure yourself, Max, that all the politicians in Michigan will get involved in this. Yeah, and they, so far the pattern has been to bail out. Right. simply print more money. So why is this going to be any different? But I want to ask you something. Well, not just bail out, settle for nothing. And this is a big risk for the banks because every public sector client they have that did a deal like the city of Detroit did, if they settle for nothing, in other words, if they just let Detroit off the hook, they're all going to want the same deal. And therefore, the, on their books, the, the holdings that they have on their balance sheets would be marked down to zero. They would have to mark them down, that's right. So on a percentage basis, Mer Merrill Lynch, for example, if you're looking at the percentage of their books that they hold on these things, if they mark down to zero, what big kind of hit are they taking on the balance sheet? Well, I don't know. It's probably not material to the overall company, but it would still be a loss. And the more interesting point is, should they be doing this in the first place? Should they have done these deals in the first place with a pedestrian public sector client that's unsophisticated? But the banks say that we do whatever the government lets us do. That's right. That's right. You know, when I was a broker, you know, when you get your license, uh, you also have to be aware of the blue sky laws in all the various states. That's right. So states have laws that are unique, that different than federal law. That's right. So Wisconsin, as I recall, was a particularly tough state mm -hmm. in terms of security selling and things like that. Do the states have the ability to uh, act independently of the federal government to crack down on securities fraud? In this case, certainly. Absolutely. And that's what may happen. In Michigan? Sure. And it goes back to these uh, these laws. Anyway, Chris Whalen, um, we're gonna have to hold you over. We're gonna have you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have you on the next show. Okay. So stay right there. This is a, a we're gonna break precedence here. Uh, so don't go away. Okay. All right. And that's gonna do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser and Stacey Herbert. I'd like to thank our guest, Chris Whalen, is gonna stick around for the next show. Uh, author of a new book, Financial Stability, Fraud and Confidence, and the Wealth of Nations. If you'd like to get in touch, tweet us at Kaiser Report. Until next time. Bye, y'all. Thank you.